Now, my first guest met over 25 years ago when she was playing a tart to his vicar in a play, in a play called Sadie. Then, three years ago, they started taking tea together on a regular basis in real life. Ladies and gentlemen, Pat Phoenix and Tony Booth. <laughs> It's your story we're actually concerned with it, to begin with tonight, Tony. Oh. Because it, it, it's absolutely true that technically you were dead. Yeah. About three years ago this time of the year, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And you'd misbehaved yourself. <coughs> <coughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hadn't. No. I hadn't. What had happened to me, had some, uh, I was caught in a fire. Not of my own making, huh? Mm-hmm. And, um, But you were not totally sober at that time, were you? No. No. I, you were... No, I wasn't. Well, I've been drinking. Yes. Right, yeah. Yeah. No. All right. I start. Shall I start from the beginning? Absolutely. Right. Very briefly, what happened was, I'd gone for an interview for a film, and afterwards I went out to dinner with the producer because I got the film, and we finished about nine o'clock because he had a heavy date, and I was going back and it started to rain, and I dived in the pub with the landlord I knew, and I was at that time trying to write a novel about SAS and things like that, and I asked this guy. People used to get in there. I said, listen, if you know anybody in the SAS, t uh, tell me, because I want to meet them. I went in, and he said, hey, tonight's your lucky night. In here, we've got these guys from the SAS. Great, I'll meet them. So I met them, bought them a drink. They started to tell me a story. We then went to the services club, had a few more drinks, and then at 10.30, now you've got to remember, this is only an hour and a half, and I was drinking heavily then. I don't drink at all now, but you wouldn't <laughs> if you heard the end, of this at the end of this story. <laughs> you wouldn't either. <clears throat> so I thought, I've got to get down notes on this, because what they're telling me is mind-blowing. Right. So I took them back to Hampstead, where I lived. I lived on the top floor of a block of flats, and the woman I was living with at the time had locked the door. She always locked me up when she uh, anyway. so, <laughs> so I couldn't get in. So there was a, a cupboard, you see. <clears throat> now, in this cupboard... Does she have a lock? Has she ever locked me out? Uh, not yet. No. No. <laughs> My door's never locked. <laughs> Don't tell everybody. So you. So you uh, in this cupboard we had um, drums. We used to heat the flat with paraffin. See? So I had these five-gallon drums, which I was going to make into a pyramid and climb up, which what in the north called the cock loft. Right? So I started. I said, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm going to make this thing, and there's a cock loft, and I climb up there and go along, drop in the flat, and I'll open the door." They said, "Don't bother. We've got a better way of doing it. What you do is." Have you got any rags? And there were some rags in the thing. He said, get the rags out, dip them in paraffin, stick them around the door jam, set fire to it. Yeah. That makes all the flames come out. It looks like hell. All the smoke pours inside, and the people come running out. We do it all the time in Northern Ireland. I went, are you crazy? My kids are in there. No, 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 no. Let me do it this way, please. So I climb up into the cock loft. I start along the top, and I'm edging my way on those rafters, you know? <laughs> and suddenly I hear this woof. And I turn around and all this flames and smoke shooting up through the hole. And I went, my God, they've done it. And I put my foot through the hole in the, you know, the, in the so ceiling. I see my little kid down there. I said, quick, get everybody up and get out. Bloody idiot to set fire to the place. I crawl back to the end and there's just black smoke billowing up. And I went, my God, we're all going to be caught because there's only one way out. So I dropped and I dropped straight into a five gallon drum of paraffin, which ignited and, and your body was alive a torch. yeah and you what, did the burns are right so I was like that. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you, well you you'll know that <laughs> <laughs> <nobody else. laughs> that's the first question well, well, that's it, well, you know i've got to tell you that's what whenever i get with ladies who are in company they're all terribly polite polite and they say he looks much better now doesn't he and i say yes and they go is he, um, <clears throat> is he all right? Down there. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? You know, just... <laughs> you said yes, he is. He went down there. <laughs> Your burns, however, are described uh, as 43% burns. That's right. Yeah. And third degree burns. And you, yeah. no one else would live under those conditions. Well, not, <clears throat> not at my age. I hasn't heard. Now, over, over 30, the, the degree of burns that you get re reduces, you know, yeah. and less yeah. chances of survival. Is there any... Is there any Should I tell you the first thing I remember in hospital, which is totally ridiculous? I come to and there's this doctor sitting on the bed and he said, oh, wow. So he said, don't worry, don't worry, you're going to be all right. We'll give you plenty of morphine, you'll be all right. So I said, 
Well, about by tomorrow, so I said. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I said, because Liverpool are playing Arsenal. I've got to do <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're going to make it. <laughs> then the next memory I had was this nurse woke me up and went, look, look, quick, quick. And I went, oh, oh, oh. She said, you're on television. <laughs> and, went, and there's a, doom, a picture of me, on a terrible old picture of my dad, saying, he's seriously ill and, you know. Dying went, of birth. Oh, God. And I pass out. Okay. Only to be woken up by the same nurse a couple of minutes later who says, and you're on ITV as well. <laughs> <laughs> Is it, by a picture, it was a is it possible for you in any way to describe the pain, or is it beyond any description? Well, uh, it defies description, truly. I mean, it is the, the most painful thing, honestly. I mean, I'm not just saying that, but that's what the doctor said. Right. It's more painful than cancer and everything. I mean, it's just... It's and a part, a, a part of the reaction you underwent was to... You, you think that you, your body, your mind, in some way left your body. No, you think. I know. <laughs> you say? Yes. Well, I say yes. But, um, I mean, at this stage, why should I... Well, no, 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 no. I'm simply interested in it clini no. clinically. Sure. I mean, do you think that in some way you were, you were so racked that your head had to go out of, away from your body? Well, I'd better start at the beginning. See, when I was a kid, I had diphtheria when I was in Liverpool. And uh, that's when I had my first experience of what I now know to be out-of-body experiences. And um, so I'd had not just one, I'd had several. Now, when you have an out-of-body experience, you don't experience pain, do you? Obviously, there's no time, there's no space, there's nothing. I mean, it's just, you know, you're away. So uh, when the pain got too much, I used to go. But there was only one problem, you <laughs> see, in intensive care. When you go, they have a little, little <laughs> things all stuck in you and everything, you know. And uh, this thing goes, doop, 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 you see. But when you go out, it goes, in other words, you're and you're dead. Or at least they think you're dead. But I wasn't, I was up there. You see? And how, <laughs> what happened when you came back? <laughs> <laughs> well, I came back, I'm way up in the, and that's in the, in the intensive care unit. And I see all the, I mean, there's panic. They are fantastic. I, I've got to say, in Burns units and in intensive care, they're great. But believe me, if somebody goes, that machine goes, there's a bit of panic creeps in. Because it so, pronounces you dead, Yes, you, you snuffed it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so so they go, there's panic going on. And I come back and I see this guy kneeling on my chest and he's doing this to me and he's knocking hell out of me. And I go, why, why doesn't somebody stop him? What's going on? Why are they all panicking? Why, why does, get that man off me. What's going on? And I hear some, a voice say, my God, he's going, he's going. And I thought, oh, thank God for that, he's going. And then I went, hell, they mean me, but I'm not going, I'm here. <laughs> now, how can I get back in? Now, if I went back in directly, I would go straight through that guy. And I've never done that before, so maybe I, I might kill him. So I have to go and come round and come into my head. So what happened is I came in and went, Wah! and set up and threw this doctor clean across the room. So you, could, you actually come back with force. I mean, oh, you and also, how? You, 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 you actually doctor. describe yourself, you see, in a kind of way like Superman, as so you, you, you can control the actual uh, route that you take back to your own body. Yeah, but I'm not the only person who's had uh, out-of-body experiences. I mean, I think it's time that people who've had out-of-body experiences have, have ought to talk about them. No, I've never been that ill. No, I've never been um, so ill that I had to... Um, I've got four slip discs at the moment, but nobody believes me. But um, I've never been well, happy that... Well, happy new year. <laughs> Thank you. I've never, ever been that ill no, where right. my, my, my mind has left my body. But I do know dozens of people who have. Right. Now, when you were actually beginning to recover, presumably you looked like a mummy. <laughs> or a no. I went down to under six stone. Did you? Did, were yeah. you wrapped around? Or, or uh, I don't know. Don't ask me. I mean, uh, I mean do, uh, all, uh, what you see is... It's just, you know, uh, like a, a, a husk. But you had difficulty walking, though, didn't you? Yeah, I could. No, it means <laughs> you weren't bandaged or anything because... No, no, because, no, they couldn't, because, I mean... They, they couldn't put anything on to No, 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 they don't. But no. you, you have described quite graphically how long it took you to get from any point to any other point. Ah, I... <laughs> I've got to tell you, you see, uh, one of the worst things in hospital, when you start to get better, it's a marvellous moment, and then, you see, now, it was months before I started to get better, and then uh, you go through what is I call the bedpan syndrome, which is, which is a terrifying... Oh, I mean, it's, everybody's embarrassed by it, and it's hell, you know, and, and you can't wait to get down to the junk, can you? So at first they wheeled me down, and then came the big moment when they said, tomorrow you're going to make your own way, you see? So I went, oh, this is great. <laughs> so, so came the next day, and they said, no, get up, and you've got to make it down to the loop. 
So it was only about 30 yards. And it took me all of half an hour with the nurses going, no, 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 don't touch me, no, I'll make it, I'll make it, to get there. So when we got to the door, I said, leave me, it's all right, I'll be able to handle it from now. So the door was a sliding door, so I slid this door back, you see, and I went in and I went, oh, I made it to the thing, you see, and I'm standing there like that. And I went, and I saw the loo, and I go towards it, like, no. and I get out of this chair. So I get to this chair and I go, oh, and I go, oh my God, what am I going to do? And I go, I know, I go, and, oh, ah, and I sit down, you see, and I say, thank God I made it. Ah, pajama trousers. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to go, <laughs> I'm doing my pajama trousers. Drop my pajama trousers. Thank God for that. Oh, hell, the door. Now, because they use uh, wheelchairs, the door's quite some way away. See, so I went, ah, oh, forget it. Anybody comes in, I'll go, oh, 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 I honestly. <laughs> I was brought up a Roman Catholic. <laughs> so you know what to shout. Yes, 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 you shout. <laughs> I don't think it's the same So I think, now, the next tomorrow, I shall make it in less than 30 minutes and I shall know exactly who's your head. The first thing you do is close the door, then you drop your pyjamas, then you stop, then it's the kind of thing. So, and meanwhile, in the intensive care unit, there are what we used to call laughingly walking wounded. And one of the walking wounded was this beautiful Indian lady, and she had done her back in, but she could walk around, you see. And so she, the first time I saw her, I and this vision, oh, incredibly beautiful lady, sort of walks past the door, <laughs> and to curiosity, she got the better of it and she went, it's all me, man. <laughs> and she walked off, you see, very slow. So, this Irish nurse is in there, and I said, who's that? She said, oh, that, that's uh, an Indian lady who was the uh, wife of the military attache of the um, Indian embassy, you see. So I said, oh, and she said, he's a Gurkha, a major in the Gurkhas. That lady, so I said, what lady? <laughs> I don't say anything. What lady is <laughs> Anyway, so that's the answer. So, uh, the next day, it takes me an hour to get to the loo. I slide the door back, and I make it, and I do the same thing. I get my hands crossed, my legs crossed, and I sit down. And I sat down, and I thought, oh, thank God I made it. I'm exhausted. Oh, hell. My pyjama trousers. I forgot my pyjama trousers. Same thing again. Eh? Drop my pyjama trousers. I can't make it to the door. The hell. I'll do as I did yesterday. I'll go, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Just as I do that, the door slides back and in comes the beautiful <laughs> lady in a cat cat, you see. And I went, ma! And she went, so she goes, uh, miss, look the other way, and then look where you are, like that. And she, and she starts walking towards me, like this. <laughs> and then when she got to me, she turned around and she went, <laughs> <laughs> I did that. I went. Ah! <laughs> she went. Oh! <laughs> no, so she turns round, looks at me, and I, she didn't speak any English. I didn't speak any Urdu. So I go. I went. Uh, uh, like that. So she went. Oh. So she goes into the other loo and does exactly the same as I do. She sits down, makes it sit down. Oh God, the cat can. So oh, <laughs> she lifts up the cat can. And sits down, and then as near as I had that camera, was sitting like this. Opposite each other, this beautiful Indian lady myself, sitting there. So I remember when I was a kid, when my mother was trying to toilet train my sister, my mother used to, to make her wee, used to whistle tunelessly. <laughs> <laughs> so I have this bright idea. So I go. <laughs> <laughs> In Urdu. <laughs> In Urdu. <laughs> yeah. oh, she oh. goes, hmm, starts to laugh. I start to laugh, the door slides back, in comes the Irish nurse, looks at the woman and says, oh, Mrs. Singh, too, and then looks at me and goes, my God, <laughs> sister, Mr. Pooh's only got a woman in the lavatory with him. <laughs> now, this is when, if we can get off the lavatory for one moment. <laughs> yes. When did, when did this lady, uh, who has helped you obviously considerably since that day, enter your life? Well, you tell us, because you've, you've been quiet for 25 minutes. Isn't it amazing, yeah? Well, I, I didn't help him. He helped himself, really. Um, Tony and I have known each other for a very long time, actually, and, say, for um, the umpteen years, we, we'd had no contact. We're not going into ages again, not all that <laughs> stuff. For a long, long time, we, we hadn't seen each other. I knew about the fact that he'd been burned. I didn't know how badly. Um, the last time we saw each other, we were both rather haughty with, with each other. And on several occasions, I was attempt, uh, attempted to go and see him, but something cropped up and I didn't. 
And then uh, he rang me one day at Granada. And uh, I said, how are you? And he said, fine, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see you. I said, sure, why don't you come over for lunch? And I had no idea just how badly he'd been burnt, or where for that matter. And so I don't know how he did it now, but he came from Liverpool and he had no money at all. And he managed to make it very well-dressed, he looked, and very cool. And we talked, and, I, and he said he wanted somewhere to look right, and it was terribly difficult back home. And I have a large cottage, and I said, there's a top floor, but no bloody anky-panky. <laughs> and uh, you can work up there, you see. And he took this up, and it was not until I saw him walk down our very rough little country lane that I realised what hell it must have been for him because he couldn't even get shoes on his feet properly. They had to be slipper-type shoes. And um, we had several incidents, <laughs> which we'll probably tell you about later. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how... Um, how would you describe the relationship between you now? If you put this embargo on hanky-panky in the early days... Oh, very much so. <laughs> I think we'd both had enough and, and we both felt... That what, hanky or panky? Oh, both. <laughs> and all the other besides. I mean, um, I was... Um, I'd had... Uh, I was uh, divorced and widowed and I think... And, and being as a town, I'd had 22 boyfriends, so they tell me. And I thought, I've been through the mill enough and I didn't want anything, any more relationships. And I think he felt the same. And He'd how would you describe your relationship now? Well, you know, it's always a temptation. You get people writing in newspapers and you come, oh, we're so happy and this is it. Oh. And six months later, they're smashed all over the place. Mm. But I, I would say that we had to wait a long time for each other. We had to go through a lot of experiences to find each other again. We both had to grow up a little, if that's possible. And if you ever found a soulmate, I think I found mine. Yeah, that's smashing. <laughs> that's really yeah. smashing. And you're, you're, good, you're each other's best friends, presumably. Oh, we kill each other from time to time. Are you rowdy? Do you <laughs> rowdy? Wow, oh, it's beautiful. But yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a strange thing. In, uh, in, in all the other rows I've had in my life, you felt it was horrid and terminal. Yeah. When we have rows, I think we're both sniggering a bit because it's, we're sort of like playing the third act. Right. <laughs> and we're saying it because, well, we ought to say it. Is anybody watching? And we know <laughs> in five minutes' time we're going to be laughing again, you see, but, at each other and ourselves. And that's a great restorative and correct. Yes. For the moment, both of you, thank you very much yes. indeed.